Right, okay. So, uh, we find ourselves in Shmuel Aleph, chapter 7. Um, let's just recap where we're up to, because it's uh, we're at a turning point, really. Um, the book of Samuel, um, you would think, would be about Samuel. But you've probably noticed that in the last few chapters, we haven't mentioned him once. Um, that's all going to change now. Uh, Shmuel is going to come back into the picture. You'll remember we started off uh, the book with Shmuel's uh, birth, uh, or even before Shmuel's birth, with his mother's request for uh, a child uh, and um, his birth. And that fact that he was taken up to the uh, Bet Mikdash at a very young age, and he had this epiphany with uh, God, and then he, we sort of put him to one side, and we read the story of uh, the battles against the Plishtim with the Ark, the destruction of Shiloh, uh, the loss of uh, a great number of men. In the battles, uh, we read about what happened with the Plishtim when they had the Ark in their possession. They got hemorrhoids and uh, possibly bubonic plague and eventually sent the Ark back and said, we don't want this. It's just the loaded Soros. Um, and then it came to the field uh, of in Bet Shemesh and people died there as well because they... Uh, they looked at it and they looked inside it, according to um, some opinions. Um, and so they said, uh, OK, this is also causing us sorrows. And that takes us to the beginning of chapter seven, which is where we um, finished off last week. So we're about to see Shmuel coming back uh, into the picture. Um, but let's just see the. Um, introduction to Shmuel coming back into the picture with the beginning of chapter seven of uh, the pe of the book, and it should be there on the screen for you. Um, there we go. Okay, so uh, Leon, if you would uh, kick us off from the beginning of chapter seven. So the men of Kiryat Yerarim came and brought up, brought up the Ark of Hashem, and they brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill, and they designated Elazar, his son, to guard the Ark of Hashem. From the time the Ark was stationed at Kiryat Yarim, there ensued many days. They were 20 years, during which the entire house, the entire house of Israel was drawn after Hashem. Okay, let's just stop there. Um, we talked about this a bit last uh, time. Um, it wasn't last Sunday, of course, because last Sunday was Tisha B'Av, so it's two weeks ago since we uh, encountered this. So in, in, in case you're thinking that it's all a bit vague, it wasn't last week. Last week was Tisha B'Av. Um, we spoke, if you remember, two weeks ago, I showed you where Kiryat Ya'arim is. Uh, Ab Abu Ghosh of today and uh, Kiryat Ya'arim, also known as Telstone, uh, on the way up to Yerushalayim there. We also spoke about these names, if you remember, Avi Nadav and his son Elazar. And we spoke about uh, Avi Nadav uh, having very strong connections to the house of Aaron uh, with his two elder sons who got killed. Uh, killed when they brought the strange fire. Their names, of course, were Nadav and Avihu, uh, or if you say them uh, the other way around, Avihu and Nadav, put them together and you get this name here, Avi Nadav. Um, so this is clearly a reference to the sons of Aaron. Elazar, of course, was the remaining, one of the two remaining sons of Aaron and who became the uh, Kohen Gadol after Aharon. So this uh, is entirely appropriate that the Ark should be in the house of Avinadav 
and that El Azar should be the one who looks after it. Yes, Marcel. You're muted. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Marcel. Unmute. We still can't hear you. No, no you're quite right. I'm sorry. Yes. The, the, my question is, which Aaron was it? The Zahav? Or, or was it the Betzalel, or was it the one of the, that Moshe made of wood? Okay, good question. Now, I refer you back to the uh, um, earlier chapter when they took the Ark out in the first place. Um, the, we had a whole discussion there about which Ark it was, because there were two Arks, as you correctly point out. There was the ark with the uh, kruvim on, in which there were the uh, luchot. And there was also the wooden ark that Moshe Rabbeinu made um, to house the broken tablets. And I showed you the psukim uh, uh, in the Torah where that was. Um, and the one of the opinions, I'm not mistaken, it was the radak, but I can't remember exactly. Uh, it was the radak, David's nodding. Uh, the Radak said that the, the reason that they failed in this uh, war was that they took the wrong ark. Uh, they were meant to take an ark. An ark was meant to go out before them in war. Uh, that's what was meant to happen. But it was meant to be the wooden one. And they took out the wrong one. They took out the golden ark with the uh, kruvim on. And that was a big mistake, says the Radak. Um, they attributed... Um, godly powers to the ark itself and that's important we're going to come back to that uh, possibly later today or maybe next week depends how far we go on probably today um, so uh, it would seem uh, Marcel to answer your question that this was the golden ark according to the Radak at least uh, that they took the golden ark which they shouldn't have done that should have stayed in Shiloh but they did take it that was the one that was captured by the Plishtim and that caused all the Taurus for them over there and that was the one that they sent back and that was the one that the men of Bet Shemesh said to the uh, the this um, Kohanic family of Abinadav come and get it because it's causing us trouble uh, so I think the simple answer to your questions at least according to the redact is that this was the golden ark um, with the Kruvim uh, in which uh, there should have been, if there wasn't, there should have been the uh, Luchot, the tablets of the Ten Commandments, which, of course, we read yesterday. Yeah. I just want to add, I, I actually wrote you a question about this the other week, about when the Pelishtim and anybody else captured the Aaron and they opened it, how come they didn't die instantly? Um, well, we don't know that they didn't. Remember, 50,070 people died. And uh, some of them are Forshim, say, and the Radak is actually one of them, that says that's why they died, because they looked inside the ark and they should not have done so. So I think, I think the question that you asked me, which I don't know the answer to, actually, it was a very good question, um, was slightly different. What you asked me was um, when... Uh, the people came uh, into the uh, Beit HaMikdash when they shouldn't have done, the Romans and the Babylonians and everybody else. If they went into the Kodesh Kodashim, did they die? Yeah. Um, I suspect the answer is no, because at that time it had sort of, as it were, lost its Kedusha. Uh, um, I, I've never read, uh, and, I, in it, and as far as I'm aware, I did, I did try and look it up in Josephus, because Josephus is the kind of, place you'd expect to find that. I never found any uh, writings there, uh, any reference to people dying when they went into the Kodesh Kodeshim. And, and I suspect that that was reserved for when the Beit HaMikdash was functioning as a temple. Um, and that was, uh, um, the whole thing sort of fell into disuse, as it were, um, when it was defiled by uh, the, the captors. Uh, that I think is probably the answer. The Shekhinah departed, but I thought I thought that the Shekhinah was only actually in the Beit Hamikdash Arishon and not in the Sheni. That is true. That is true. And also, of course, the Aaron 
was not in the Bay Cheney either. Uh, it got lost and Harrison Ford has been looking for it ever since. Um, so the, the second Beit HaMikdash did not have the Aron. Uh, it became lost. Um, you're quite right. There was now, a half, there was a half, sorry to, there was a half Torah about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, where they moved the, uh, the Aron from one place to another on a truck, they took it, and they started to slip off the truck and the guy got off and just to secure it and he died immediately. Correct. We will, get, we will get to that later on in Shmuel. I'm not sure yeah. if it's in uh, the end of Shmuel Aleph or the beginning of Shmuel Bet, but okay. it's uh, that story, it, uh, uh, it took place in the reign of King David. Yeah. Um, and uh, we will get to that in, uh, in probably in a few months' time. Um, what so, relation was this Avinadav and Elaza to the original Avinadav? I and, don't know. Uh, We're not told. But, but there is no doubt in my mind that the, the name Avinadav is uh, a, a reference to the children of Aaron. And I don't think it's a coincidence that his son was called Elazar. Uh, and that they why, why didn't the father look after it? Why did he give it to his son? That son chance to get it. Maybe his son was uh, was you know the big the big oh, uh, okay. big Talmud Chacham. I don't know the holy one of the family. Don't know. Um, but uh, he was this family was clearly uh, connected to Aharon Akoin. Uh, it's it's too much of a coincidence that these names um, should be that we should be told these names. Uh, and that they should be so connected to Aaron and that they should be looking after the Ark. It makes complete sense that these uh, were uh, Kohanic families. Um, so that's what we spoke about last time. Johnny, can we dedicate this year to Rabbi Steinfeld? Oh, yes, yes, of yes, course. Uh, of course. Uh, is it today? His, uh, yeah, first I think year? yesterday, I think it was. Okay, either today or yesterday. Uh, um, Actually, I thought it was the 17th of Av. Which yeah, is it is. So it's tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. yeah, it's the 17th of Av. Yes, you're quite right. We should we should dedicate this shear to the memory of Rav Aiden Steinsaltz, um, who, of course, uh, has contributed so, so much uh, to the Jewish people uh, in his life with his writings, which we are uh, privy to and are using uh, many times uh, a week, just amongst us all, um, and Yehizichro um, Baruch. I hope that his neshama is getting some kind of pleasure from the fact that we are using his sforim and that we continue to benefit from his amazing, amazing work that he did. Yesterday, somebody in shul um, asked me for a uh, Gemara Sukkah. He was learning Dafayomi one of our visitors, um, and I went to the, uh, the Beta Midrash and somebody else had chapped the uh, art scroll uh, and it wasn't there where it should be. So I looked around and I found a Hebrew Steins out uh, sukkah and I gave it to him and he was really pleased uh, that he was able to keep up with the daf. Um, so um, he had that zechus as well. So um, yeah, we dedicate that to, to Rav Steins out. Thank you for rem reminding me, Johnny. Uh, Johnny, I've got I've got the um, art scroll. If he wants particularly to look at that, the sukkah, um, the sukkah, uh, sukkah. Yeah, so, I think it was, and he was just in shul. He wanted to to catch up during the sermon or during the Ten Commandments right. or I don't know okay. some other some other unimportant part of the davening. Um, so uh, there you go. Thank you. Right. So uh, look at this verse two. It stayed there for 20 years. The uh, interesting, let me just let Howard in. There we go. Um, it, it's interesting that um, it stayed, the Ark stayed in um, the Plishti territory for not very long and caused all sorts of havoc. Uh, it was in the fields in Bet Shemesh for not very long and caused all sorts of trouble. And it managed to stay for 20 years in Kiryat Ya'arim, in the house of Avinadav, uh, under the stewardship of El Azar. And it doesn't seem to have caused any uh, problem, uh, presumably because it was looked after with the appropriate kavod. 
And here we see something, and all the house of Israel were drawn after the Lord. Um, and this seems to have been a, the first uh, part of a two-part Baal Teshuva movement, okay? I won't say that this was the first Baal Teshuva movement because it wasn't, because you've all learnt uh, Sefer Shoftim uh, uh, together. And of course, that was a continual cycle of Baal Teshuva, uh, followed by uh, bad behavior again, and then a Teshuva once again. But this time, this time we are uh, about to see the uh, the stewardship of, of Shmuel, and um, as we've said on another a couple of occasions, and we're going to see um, actually uh, some comparisons later on, Shmuel was, is compared on many occasions to Moshe Rabbeinu in his greatness. Shmuel, in his generation, was um, the Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, he was the greatest. Um, and um, his You'll see here his method and his success of, of, of dealing with the people is unprecedented up till now. Remember, up till now, we've had this cycle of up and down with uh, each uh, judge doing a bit for a while and then it all falling apart. And of course, as we said right from the beginning, that in, in uh, Rabbi uh, Irving Jacobs's beautiful expression, the uh, Book of Shmuel is the bridge between anarchy and monarchy. Anarchy of uh, Sefer Shoftim, where every man did as that was good in his eyes, as, as, as Shoftim says, and there was no king in Israel, until uh, the days of King Saul and then King David and King Solomon, the glory days uh, of the uh, people of Israel. And the bridge between those two uh, uh, periods of anarchy to monarchy uh, was Shmuel Hanavi and that's what this book is all about and this is the beginning now we're about to now get into the nitty-gritty of Shmuel's life and how he led the people with great success and how he managed uh, the uh, transformation from a disparate group of tribes who were um, at best a loose confederation into a, uh, a monarchy uh, of the whole of Israel, which, as we've said on many occasions, sadly did not last very long, only lasted until the end of the reign of King Solomon before it all um, fell apart and the kingdom split. But we're about to see uh, Shmuel's very strong influence in bringing about the successful period of monarchy uh, of the house of all of Israel. And it begins here, uh, really, uh, in the second half of verse 2. Vayinahu kol bet Yisrael acharei Hashem. And all the house of Israel were drawn after the Lord. So we now have that first stage of the, of the Teshuvah movement. All the people in Israel are beginning to follow Hashem again. But, as we've said uh, on a few occasions, um, there was a little bit of um, schizophrenia going on here. Uh, and verse 3 gives us the clue. The Baal Teshuvah movement has started, but it's not yet complete. Verse 3, Leon. Samuel said to the entire house of Israel, saying... If you are returning unto, unto Hashem with all your hearts, then remove the foreign gods and the Ashtarot from your midst and direct your hearts to Hashem, serving him alone. Then he will rescue you from the hand of the Philistines. Okay, let's, uh, no, let's do one more verse. So the children of Israel removed the Baalim and the Ashtarot and served Hashem alone. Okay, now what does that tell you? What do those two psukim tell you? Uh, well, let's say, what does the second half of verse 2 plus verses 3 and 4 tell you about what was going on uh, in the Israelite camp at this time? 
observations. Anyone? I'm not quite sure what they were doing. They were worshipping other gods as well. Right, exactly. That's they, they, they were sort of sitting on the fence, really. They were they were drawn after Hashem, but they still, uh, according to Shmuel, uh, Shmuel had to tell them to remove the foreign gods from their midst. Um, and he specifies the Ashtarot. We'll come back to Ashtarot in a moment. And he says, and direct your heart toward the Lord and serve him alone. Let's have a look at the Hebrew. That means levad, alone. So what's going on here, as we see from these psukim, is something a phenomenon that, that we've described on a few occasions in the past. And that is that, yes, the, uh, the B'nai Israel was serving Hashem. Hashem was their special God. But they were also serving other gods. And they had not yet, or at this time had not, this time around at least, managed to... Um, really fully take on board the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments, um, which, uh, of course, we read yesterday, and says that I am Hashem, your God, lo Elohim acherim al panai. Do not have any other gods from upon my face, literally, or in front of me. In other words, I am the only one. And we also read yesterday in the Sedra, uh, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu. Listen, uh, Israel, Hashem is our God. They've got that. They've got that. What they haven't got is the end of the Pasuk. Hashem Echad. God is the one and only. Here, in our verses here, verses 2, 3, and 4, of chapter 7 of Shmuel Aleph, we can see that they are beginning to understand that Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu, but they haven't yet got Hashem Echad. God is the only one. They're having to be told by Shmuel, that's not good enough that you are drawn after Hashem. You've got to get rid of these foreign gods. Now, this is not an unusual scenario. Where did we see, where did we see in the uh, uh, Torah itself where somebody, uh, one of our heroes, um, got involved with foreign gods? What am I referring to? Who can read my mind? Okay, David, come on, tell us. Rachel. Rachel, correct. And where will I find it? Parashat by Yishlach. Okay. In Bereshit, we will find it. Do you know what chapter it is? Um, so, uh, so it's, it's in Vayetze, not uh, by Yishlach. Um, it's somewhere around Hamishi. Let's have a look. Not sure what chapter. Phone a friend. Anyway, um, let's see if we can find it while we're talking. Uh, you try and find it for me, David, will you? Okay. Um, now, I'll tell you the story. You'll remember it. Um, Yaakov decides it's time to leave his father-in-law, Lavan. He gathers his uh, wives and his children, grandchildren, no, his children, I mean, his wives and his children. And um, he does a runner in the middle of the night, remember? And Lavan chases after them. And he gets to them and he says, why did you run away? You never even let me say goodbye to my children, to my daughters and my grandchildren. That wasn't very nice. And you also stole my gods. And Yaakov gets a bit miffed at this and he says no 
I never stole any of your gods. Have a look around. If you can find anything of mine, whoever's got it, then that person should die. Have you found it, David? Yeah. Uh, Perik uh, Lamadalus Pasuk Yudtet. Pasuk Lamad. Okay, there we go. It's on the screen for you now. There we go. Um, so what had happened um, is that Rachel, unbeknown to uh, Yaakov, Rachel, Rachel Imeni, Imenu, Mama Rachel, had stolen her father's idols. There it is in verse 19. Leon, are you with us? Uh, chapter 31, did uh, David. Chapter 31 of Bereshit. Yes, I have it. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole the teraphim that belonged to her father. Jacob deceived Laban, <coughs> the Aramean, by not telling him that he was fleeing. Okay, Thus so he stop fled there, with and then skip, had... stop there, and then skip. Um, to um, there we go. Skip to verse 30. Now you have left because you longed greatly for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I thought perhaps you might steal your daughters from me. With whomever you find your gods, he shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, ascertain for yourself what is with me and take it back. Now, Rick, now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Okay, let's stop there. So what had happened here was that Rachel had stolen these gods of, uh, of her father um, and... Ya um, Yaakov, her husband, did not know, and he made an oath, and he said, whoever has taken these shall not live. Well, she didn't live very much longer, did she, Rachel? What happened was very shortly after this, she died in childbirth, giving birth to Binyamin. So unbeknown to uh, Yaakov, he uh, made an oath, which actually came true. He said, whoever uh, has stolen these gods shall not live. And that's what happened to Rachel. And so then, of course, they never found them because Rachel, had, uh, look at, look at uh, verse uh, 30, 34. Now Rachel had taken the teraphim, put them into the camel's pack saddle and sat on them. Lavan rummaged through the whole tent but found nothing. She said to her father, let not my Lord find it annoying that I cannot rise up before you, for the way of women is upon me. Thus he searched, but did not find the teraphim. So she sat on the saddlebag and she says, I'm sorry, Dad, I can't go up because, you know, it's that time of the month. And uh, he never found them. Uh, but why did she want them in the first place? That's the question we've got to ask. Rachel Imenu. Why did she want these traffin? Okay, uh, who would like to suggest some answers why she uh, might have taken these traffin, these these gods? Um, just to destroy them when she got the chance. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, that's very. Um, that's very. What's it called of you? Very good-minded of you, uh, Johnny, to think that. Uh, I'm, I'm not mistaken. I'm just going to have a quick look at Rashi. I think Rashi actually says that. Uh, could be wrong, but let me just have a look. Yes, there we go. I'm correct. I did remember correct. Rashi um, says, like Johnny Halpern. <laughs> okay, he says, <laughs> Her intention was to take these gods so that her father would not be able to worship idols. So in other words, he, she was doing that which Abraham had done in the Midrash that tells us, the famous Midrash that tells us that he smashed up the idols in the idol shop. Um, so that's uh, Rashi's opinion. Any other suggestions as to why she might have taken them? I think she, she's, she's, 
she was probably brought up with these all her life and hadn't quite got, you know, couldn't quite give them up. You know, didn't quite believe what was going on, what was in the future. Stuart is not quite as good minded as Johnny. <laughs> and he's thinking, uh, he's thinking that she can't quite give them up. And I have to say, uh, I'm with you on this one, Stuart. That's exactly what I think. Uh, I think that this is an example of what we um, were uh, dealing with, or what we are dealing with. Here we go back to our Pasuk here. I think that Rachel was uh, fully uh, committed to Yaakov's God, Hashem, but she could not yet bring herself to separate herself from the gods of her father. And uh, I think that that's why she took them. She was one of these people, like the people we're dealing with here, who were hedging their bets. And this was a very common scenario throughout Jewish history. We've said this before, but I think it bears repeating. And that is that you, in fact, the Rambam says, very interesting, the Rambam says that every single mitzvah in the Torah is uh, designed to move us away from idol worship. So, for example, the, 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 the halachot of milk and meat, that we should separate milk and meat, that is something to design to make us move away from idol worship because there was some idol worship that went on that involved putting meat and milk together. The Rambam says that the entirety of the Torah is all about monotheism. The rest of it is just um, the way to get there. The ultimate aim of the Torah is to, is to instill in us the idea of monotheism. Now, for us in the 21st century, it's obvious that sort of whole idea of polytheism, of, uh, of pantheism, really, of a whole bunch of different gods is no, it's not something that we have a huge desire to get involved with. We have a completely different set of challenges in the 21st century. But back at the time that this is going on, that was the number one challenge, was to uh, move away from the uh, polytheistic approach uh, to the world. And uh, it was very, very hard for these people to do it. It will be a bit like, you know, in today's society, uh, for us to say, okay, well, you know, you're going to have to remove yourself entirely from uh, any kind of uh, online presence, right? So no phones, no mobile phones, no tablets, no computers, no Facebook, no Zoom, no emails. Imagine how difficult that would be for us today. That's how involved the world was with polytheism at that time. It was the everyday fabric of their society. In the same way uh, as, I mean, apart from Shabbat, uh, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, some people would think this was wonderful, but not the people that I'm speaking to because you wouldn't be able to do this because we're on Zoom. But can you imagine, again, from this moment on, I said to you, you are never ever allowed to go on the internet or use a mobile phone or a computer uh, or a tablet or an iPhone or anything like that, finished. Never again. How difficult would that be for us? It would be tremendously difficult. Um, and that's only been part of our lives for the last, what, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Uh, uh, most of you uh, on here are older than me, but even I can remember most of my life without the internet and without mobile phones and stuff. But can you imagine if I said to us all now, nothing, you can't use it. I'd have to go back. How am I going to do my work? All my work is on the internet. Impossible. How would you find anything? How would you get your Tavia Rock? How would you make appointments for the doctor? How would you get, without a mobile phone, you couldn't do it. It would be a complete and utter change in your whole way of life. And that is what Shmuel was asking them to do. This was, a, a, don't underestimate. Uh, for us, it's easy. I mean, you know, 
who, who, who really could possibly be be uh, um, willing to, to uh, you know, there's a picture, I don't know if you can see it on there. There's a picture of a, an Ashtarot, one of the Ashtarot. And there's another picture of some, where's the Baalim? There's the Baalim. If you can see it properly. There you go. We can't, can't see, see it. it. Take your background off, Johnny. That's okay. Right. Let me take the background off and I'll show it you. Um, one sec. Punch and Judy. Yeah. Okay. Let me take the uh, let me take the background off and I'll show you. One sec. There we go. Right. See that? That is one of the Ashtarot. That's an Ashtara. Okay. That's a fertility goddess. And those on the other side of the page there, oh no, where are we? There, that's it, where my fingers are. These are Baalim. These are models of Baalim, of foreign gods. And these ones, those Baalim, were found in the 12th century BCE. Okay, the 12th century BCE, which is the exact period of time that we are dealing with in Shmuel. So those things that I've just showed you over here, those things that these, there we go, those ones where my fingers are here on this page, these were found uh, in the area and these could very likely have been gods that uh, people were worshiping. Now for us, that's mental. How would we possibly think that they could be gods? It's stupid. But that was their way of life. And these were the things that they were uh, um, so ingrained in, in, their, uh, in their life uh, that it was a big ask, a very big ask for, um, for, for, for what Shmuel was asking them to do. Um, and so what he was saying is verse three. Verse three again for us, Leon. Samuel said to the entire house of Israel, saying... If you are returning unto Hashem with all your hearts, then remove the foreign gods and the Ashtarot from your midst and direct your hearts to Hashem, serving him alone. Then he will rescue you from the hands of the Philistines. So it's all connected here. You want to be rescued from the hands of the Philistines, you've got to go the whole hog, if you'll pardon the expression, and you've got to get rid of all these foreign gods. So what that means is that um, you can't have a situation whereby you are um, Jewish on Shabbos and on Sunday you're going to uh, the temple to worship these gods, these Ashtaroth. And that's what the people did. Um, I've mentioned this one second, David, I'll come to you in a sec. You can see you've got your hand up. I've mentioned this before, uh, but if you want a very readable overview of how people lived in those times, it's uh, very readable because it's in a novel form. The source by James Michener um, goes through this in very great detail, how the people had uh, this sort of dual existence. They would be serving God, who he refers to as uh, YHWH, YHWH, YHWH. Um, and at the same time, would have their Ashtarot and would go to the Ashtarot temples and do all sorts of uh, uh, um, sorts of uh, ceremonies there at their temples. It would be a bit like us going to shul on Shabbos and going to church uh, on Sunday. And now that sounds weird to us, but that's how they lived their lives. And Shmuel is trying to tell us no, but we have to understand the revolution that this was. And it fits in with what happened yesterday, what we read about yesterday. Moshe Rabbeinu was reminding the people of the revolution that went on at Har Sinai. This was not something that was a one-off. This was something that was a one-off. This was not something that was just, you know, uh, 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 a fad. This was an, a, a complete change of philosophy. One God and one God only. Monotheism without any other hedging your bets with other people's gods, 
was something which was completely revolutionary for the time. It was not something that, that people were uh, involved in at all. And it was a big ask. And this is what Shmuel is asking them to do again. This is again another comparison that we see between Shmuel and Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu said to the people, it's one God and one God only. Shmuel is doing the same thing here. Yes, David Marks. Uh, yeah, have a look at uh, another comparison from Sefer Bereshit, where the wording is very, very close to the wording that we have here. Uh, it's uh, chapter 35, verse 1 to 3, 1 to 4. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, chapter 35 of Bereshit, let's have a look. Okay, so uh, verses what? One to four. Okay, Leon, are you with us? Yes. God oh, said go. to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from Esau, your brother. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Discard the alien gods that are in your midst, cleanse yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Beit El. I will make there an altar to God, who answered me in my time of distress and was with me on the road that I traveled. So they gave to Jacob all the alien gods that were in their possession, as well as the rings that were in their ears. And Jacob buried them underneath the terebinth near Shechem. Okay. That's interesting. It. Very interesting. Uh, thank you for that, uh, David. Exactly the same idea. The foreign gods. So what's interesting here is we see that um, in this section here and in the section we saw before with Rachel, Jacob, Yaakov, is completely... Uh, um, innocent of any kind of uh, involvement in this it's Jacob saying to his household remove your gods he couldn't believe that anybody would have taken one of Lavan's gods so much so that he said whoever's taken it shall not live so now it was Rachel and here he now says to his household I know you've got these foreign gods get rid of them uh, and it's another example of, of uh, how that's how life was. Uh, and so we see on several occasions uh, in the Torah, in, and particularly Moshe Rabbeinu in, in Sefer Dvarim, even started in, in, with yesterday. When you come to the land, you're going to have to get rid of all these things, break down the other people's uh, Mizbeach, uh, cut down their Asherah trees. Don't have anything to do with them. al name. Do not favor them. Don't get involved with them. Don't marry their daughters. Don't drink wine with them. Don't have anything to do with them. Why? Because sooner or later, if you do, you will be drawn after their gods. Now, their gods may look like those pictures I've just seen, or their gods may look like, you know, I don't know, Bobby Charlton or uh, uh, Elvis Presley or whatever other god with a small g uh, uh, that the local population might be worshipping at that time. Uh, and this was warnings to get rid of these foreign gods. There's only one God. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Uh, and that is what Shmuel was uh, trying to do here. So let's just go back. As in the Shema, we should look at our senses to remind us not to look at other gods. Right. Or eat them or time, you shall see them. Yeah, and you shall remember that that is, that is it, correct. Let's yes. go back to Shmuel, uh, verse, chapter 7 again. So they did it, verse 4. So the children of Israel removed the Baalim and the Ashtarot and served Hashem alone. Okay, that sounds very easy. Yeah, one little sentence, they did it. But we have to remember and realise what an utter revolution that was that Shmuel achieved. 
Um, and then when he saw that, um, we now get to see what happened after that as a result of it. Verse 5. Then Samuel said, Gather all of Israel to Mitzpah, and I will pray to Hashem for you. So they gathered at Mitzpah. They drew water and poured it out before Hashem and fasted on that day. They said there, we have sinned to Hashem. And Samuel judged the people, the children of Israel at Mitzpah. Okay, let's stop there. Uh, there's a lot to talk about here in these two psukim. First of all, Mitzpah. Where have we come across Mitzpah before? We have come across Mitzpah before. Where have we come across Mitzpah? Anybody remember? Mitzpah Ramon. Mitzpah Yam. Mitzpah Yam. Where's Mitzpah Yam, Jeffrey? Well, I thought it was in the Negev. Mitzpah Ramon, that is. Okay, I'll tell you where Mitzpah Yam is, Jeffrey, and why you know it. It's the name of the hotel round the corner from the flat on Jabotinsky Street. You're right. That's not, that is why you know the name Mitzpe Yam. That is, the word Mitzpe uh, means look out or watch out from Tzofe. Uh, the Tzofim in he modern Hebrew are scouts, right? Because they're scouts, they scout out. So uh, Letzapot means to look out. It also means to expect. Uh, so Mitzpe Yam, that hotel that you just referred to, uh, means uh, basically a view over the sea. Uh, so, yeah, so yeah, that's where you've come across Mitzpe. And somebody said Mitzpe Ramon, uh, which is uh, in the south, of course, uh, where uh, the uh, Mahdish, where the crater is. Um, but we have come across the place Mitzpe in our learning together, uh, a month or two ago. Anybody remember what happened at Mitzpeh? Mitzpeh Yericho, perhaps. Mitzpeh Yericho, uh, well, that's, that was a long while ago. Uh, yes, Mitzpeh Yericho is, is a place which looks out over Jericho, uh, but that wasn't what I was referring to. The actual mit place, Mitzpeh itself, which is this same Mitzpeh that Shmuel is talking about, we came across at the end of Sefer Shoftim. What happened in the end of Sefer Shoftim? What was the last story uh, in Sefer Shoftim? Um, we referred to it in yesterday. Yesterday we referred to it very briefly at the end of the Shia in between Mincha and Mariv, Johnny and Mervin. Remember the story of the Pilegesh Begiva, the concubine, concubine, he said porcupine then. Concubine, the concubine at Giva. Remember this story there where this uh, Ishlevi had this uh, Pilegesh and the men of uh, Binyamin uh, raped her and she died and they failed to bring them to justice. And the Bnei Israel attacked Binyamin in an act of civil war and almost wiped out Binyamin. We were talking about it yesterday in the shiur between Mincha and Mariv because we were talking about Tuba'av uh, and the, the, the involvement of that story was that uh, uh, they, they had made an oath not to allow Binyamin to marry into the rest of Bnei Israel, and that was undone uh, on Tuba'av. That's why we were talking about it yesterday. But uh, Mitzpeth is the place where they gathered where Bnei Israel gathered to attack Binyamin. They gathered at Mitzpah and they made an oath and said, we are going to wipe out Binyamin. We're going to attack Binyamin if they don't deal with uh, these uh, guilty men who've raped this uh, Pilegesh. Uh, so Mitzpah was the place where uh, they gathered together to make this momentous decision to attack their brother Binyamin. Um, so if that was the case, then we know where Mitzpah was. Mitzpah was on the border of Binyamin, and, uh, and we will see it right now. 
modern day name for um, for mitzpah is Tel En Nazbe. Now that uh, is an Arabic name. Nun and Mem are interchangeable, so that's Mazbe and Bet and Pay are interchangeable. Uh, so Mitzpah becomes Nizbe. Okay, the Bet and the Pay is very common. Uh, do you know the place called Shechem? What's Shechem called today? What's the modern na day name for Shechem? Nablus. 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 Yeah. Nablus. Change the bet to a pay and you get Neapolis. That was its name. That was its Roman name was Neapolis. Uh, and that becomes Nablus. Um, so um, where is uh, where is Mitzpah? Now, if you, I don't know if you can see the map on the screen here. Let me just make it a bit bigger for you. Um, you can see there's Abu Ghosh. Yeah. Um, so we know where Kiryat Ya'arim is. It's right, right over there. Um, let's just go over here. Nebu, Nebi Samuel. That is the place of Samuel's uh, um, tomb. It's not really, but that's where uh, it's thought to be. Okay. So that's Samuel's tomb. That's right in the same area. Um, we, if we have a look, we'll also see... Um, we will also see Bet Ale. Where's Bet Ale? It's up here somewhere, very close by. Um, there we go. There's Bet Ale. That little red blob. Can you see the red blob on the screen? Yeah. That that is um, that is Tel El Nazbe, which is uh, the biblical city of Mitzpeh, where, where all this happened. Okay, now look where it is. It's right next to, to Ramallah. There's Ramallah. There's Psagot. Anybody ever been to the Psagot winery? I've been to the Psagot winery. I went to a wedding there. Rabbi Portnoy's son, Mendy, got married in the Psagot winery. And you can see where it is. It's very close to, uh, to Ramallah. Um, it's in the, uh, in the Shtachim. And I uh, foolishly followed ways to get there. And it took me all the way through this area here. And I was about, I was about 40 minutes. I never saw an Israeli number plate. I only saw uh, uh, Palestinian number plates. And I was starting to get decidedly sweaty and worried. The wife had a puncture, et cetera, et cetera. It was not a pleasant journey, I can tell you, to get to Psagot. Um, but it's right close to Mitzpeh. Uh, Betel is very close. There it is over here. Um, Shiloh is up here, uh, very close to. This is where it all happened. And if we go to our uh, map, our um, famous map, let me share our famous map with you. There it is. Um, there is the, the um, territory of Binyamin. And there's the territory of Yehuda. There's the territory of the Plishtim. There's Betel. There's Shiloh. Mitzpah is uh, um, actually north. I think Jerusalem's a bit, a bit high there. It needs to be a bit lower. It's just on the border over here of Binyamin and Yehuda and very close to the border of the Plishtim. Uh, it's the, 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 the close to the border of Dan, Binyamin and Yehuda is Mitzpah. And that was a very important place because it was the place where they gathered um, to attack Binyamin. And it was also the place um, here where Shmuel, um, Shmuel uh, um, gathered the people. Let's go back to our um, text. In verse 5, Shmuel said, gather all Israel to Mitzpah, and I shall pray to the Lord on your behalf. Now, why did they go to Mitzpah? Why did they go to Mitzpah? Um, and why did they, uh, um, 
Why did they go to mitz? Hang on one sec. Five minutes, I'll be gone. Okay. Um, why did they go to Mitzbah and not Shiloh? Why didn't they go to Shiloh where the, the Mishkan was? Any offers? Yes, David. Shiloh had been destroyed in chapter yeah. four. Yeah, Shiloh's gone. Shiloh's history. Shiloh is where the Mishkan was. But in chapter four, in the battle between uh, the Palestine and Bnei Israel, Shiloh is gone. So why didn't they go to Betel? Betel was the other place where they uh, had a, a temple. Why didn't they go to Betel? Any offers? David? Rival uh, priesthood. Yeah, this is still, we've still got rival priesthoods here. Shmuel um, is saying, making, Shmuel is making a statement here. Gather all Israel to Mitzpah. He's deliberately not going to Betel. Um, Betel is the shul that Shmuel doesn't go to, right? We all know the joke about the, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the, the desert island when he's, the fellow is uh, there and there's two shuls. He says, well, you're the only guy here. Why do you have two shuls? You don't need two shuls. He says, yeah, that's the one I don't go to. But everyone, there's always a shul that somebody doesn't go to. Well, Betel was the shul that Shmuel didn't go to, right? So Mitzpeh took over from Shiloh as the uh, central area for uh, prayer. Shmuel says, let's go to Mitzpeh. I shall pray to Hashem on your behalf. Um, and um, we'll, we'll go next week into this in a bit more detail. We'll just do verse six uh, 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 briefly. So they gathered at Mitzpeh. They drew water and poured it out before Hashem and fasted on that day. <clears throat> they said there, we have sinned to Hashem. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mitzpah. Okay, so in that verse, we've got a few things that I want you to think about um, before uh, next week. Um, first of all, what's all this drawing water and pouring it out all about? Uh, some kind of um, Tekes, some kind of ceremony going on with water. Uh, where, where's that come from? Uh, what does it signify? They fasted on that day. Okay, I understand that. And they said, we've sinned. And Shmuel judged the children of Israel in Mitzpah. Um, so there's a few little things in that pasuk that I want you to think about before next week. Uh, and that is, what's the water all about? Uh, and what is Shmuel judging them on? Uh, and uh, and what's going on here with this business with the water. And we'll go into that, but it's that Hashem next week. Uh, I am going to um, call it a day now because my uh, grandson is about to leave and I want to say goodbye to him. I might not see him for a few uh, weeks because he's going back up north. So um, I, if you've got any uh, burning questions, uh, you can send them to me on WhatsApp. Um, otherwise, um, we'll meet again on... Uh, Wednesday for the Gemara share. Shavua Tov, everyone. Shavua Tov, thank you very much. Thank you, Shavua Tov. Thank you, Shavua Tov. Thank you, Shavua Tov.